Can you hear me all right? I mean, is the mic working? All right. Uh, let me start off very, very easily. I, I've been to Kansas City a number of times in the past. I, actually, I did some work here, did a couple of jobs here. Uh, and some of them, I think, are still standing. Some of them, maybe not, because they were so old that they were torn down. But uh, in any case, I, I've you know, very much enjoyed being part of the, the uh, history here. Now, this was me a long time ago. Uh, a lot of more hair. It was a kind of a, a, a caricature that somebody made. A lot more hair, but kind of a wicked smile. The wicked smile remains the hair don't. Uh, so let me, let me talk to you, first of all, about where we stand today and where, where this industry, this fabric structures industry, has evolved. When we go into our bathroom and the tub is full and we step into the tub and the water sloshes over the side, we think, well, gee, that's terrible, gotta wipe it up. Another guy, a long time ago, Archimedes, stepped into his bathtub, you know, the water sloshed over the side and he said, Eureka, I've just discovered something new. I figured out how Sure the mic's not working? Uh, can you guys, is it projecting for you? Louder? No. You are on. I'm on. Anyway, oh, that's a little louder. I can hear it here. Uh, he figured out that uh, when, when a body steps into the water like this, the displaced uh, water tells you something about the, dis the buoyancy of the, of the uh, uh, body itself. And that was, that was a very major discovery. It was an innovative discovery. There were other innovative discoveries. For instance, when, when uh, Einstein was walking along the street in, in uh, Zurich, he was going on his way to uh, his, his job. He, at the time, he was a, a patent clerk. And, and as he was walking along, he was talking to his friend, and the two of them discussed some aspects of uh, elasticity and particularly magnetism and suddenly he had an inspiration and he thought about what does one object appear to another rel relative to another one and that was really the basis of the of his theory of relativity now he said and this is this is Einstein he said a new idea comes suddenly and rather in a rather intuitive way he was very much involved with intuition. He always thought that intuition played a large part, but that was not all from his point of view. I'll come back to that concept later. Brunelleschi, and some of you I'm sure are aware that Brunelleschi is the, the man who designed the main cathedral in Florence, but he also was the first one to develop perspective drawing. Now, no longer were drawings made flat on a piece of paper, but with perspective, you could actually see a three-dimensional object uh, viewed on a piece of paper. Now, he also had this ability to, to go beyond what already existed. That moment of sudden inspiration, you know, that, that thinking which takes a a kind of a leap, a, a quantum leap over what has existed to the date. Uh, we normally don't experience that, but a few people do experience that, and that's what leads to innovation. Today I'll talk about innovation in kind of a limited field, mainly that, that of tensile architecture. What do we mean by tensile architecture? Basically, the use of fabrics, the use of uh, cables, ropes, to create an architectural image. One of the, there were two events that I, I feel are, are key to the whole development of tensile architecture. One of them was the, the Colosseum. Hmm. Let me try it here. Yes. One of them was the Colosseum. The Colosseum 
And if you've ever been to Rome, you know that Rome was a brutally hot place in the summer. So when, the, when they designed the Colosseum and built the Colosseum, they said, you know, we've got to do something about the heat. So we're going to put a canopy over part of the Colosseum to protect the people who are in the most important seats. That canopy, uh, which they call the velarium, was actually built. We don't know exactly what it looked like. There are a lot of images uh, prepared over, over time. There are, this is, for instance, a, a painting in the 19th century, which represents a, a, a kind of a fabric cover over the part of the Colosseum. It's not technically accurate because we know certain things about it actually don't work. For instance, you can't have the fabric so flat. But the, the, the development of, of that, that fabric cover really was one of the most important key points in the development of fabric architecture. It was the first time that fabrics were used in an architectural way, apart from, of course, the tents that the nomads used in different parts of the world, in, uh, particularly in the desert areas. Now, it was, a, it was a development that was kind of dead end. I mean, nothing came after it for a long, long time. And, and the question is why? Now, there's a second, a second uh, event that occurred almost 2,000 years later, and that is when uh, Buckminster Fuller uh, decided he wanted to look at the development of a large span space, he came up with an idea that he called the uh, aspension structure. Aspension is a word that he invented. He was constantly inventing words. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with he when he came up with a car and, and a home, he called them Dymaxion car, Dymaxium home. And earlier, about 10 years before this, he came up with an idea called Tensegrity, not by himself, but with, a, with an, an architect who was working with him at the time, uh, Kenneth Snelson. Now, Kenneth Snelson uh, really is, is a I would call him the developer of, of the Tensegrity concept, although Buckminster Fuller claimed the, the uh, credit for it. Now, Buckminster, uh, Tensegrity is a, a way of dealing with discontinuous compression. So you have, for instance, this column, which was one of the first things that uh, they designed and that uh, Snelson actually had built. This column, you see the posts, the, the compression elements are discontinuous, and yet you have a, a structure that rises way up in the sky. In Kansas City, you've got one of these, and it's not too far from here. And it's, a, it's called, I think, the crown. Now again, the idea of the, of the uh, aspension roof is an idea that, that, although it was a very original idea, never went anywhere at the time. Why didn't it go anywhere? In the same way that the uh, Bellarium didn't get any, any uh, more, uh, that there was no progress after the Bellarium. The reasons are, are, are twofold. Well, first of all, as far as the Romans were concerned, well, the Romans, they had, they had certain kinds of fabric. They were, they were uh, linens, they were, they were cotton fabrics. They had ropes, they were mostly, uh, uh, you know, simple, simple ropes, uh, hemp was the main material. Uh, and these, these, you, these uh, elements that they use, uh, they, they had experimented with them over the years and came up with, with what the limits were of those elements. They decided how far they could go, how strong they were, based on, on uh, failure of one or the, the fact that one of them didn't last very long. In the same way, uh, they looked at the, the, the technique. How, how do you get this thing across there? And they, they uh, really looked at the, tech, the, the technology. And it's because of the technology that we know something about this valerium. Because if you look at the Colosseum, you see that there's a support, a socket kind of post. And you know that there was a post that was put into that. And based on that, they, the Scientists who've looked at it really came to uh, a conclusion that there was, in actuality, a, a fabric roof over that portion of the structure. And we still don't know exactly how far it went, what it looked like in detail, 
right? We, so we, we suppose that it must have looked a little bit like a Roman shade, because if you think about it, and you have a, a circular structure, and you, you put cables out toward the center, uh, these cables are non-parallel, so you, you, if you were going to hang a fabric between them, you've got to make sure that uh, the fabric can be, can be pulled back, which means that it has to have a deeper a sag at the middle than, and then the back. So it looks like a, a little like a Roman shade. In the case of, of uh, Bucky Fuller, the problem there was he had an idea, a great idea, but the technology really was a little beyond him. He, he really couldn't go beyond just coming up with the idea itself. And the, the means of analysis uh, for that, that kind of a very highly redundant structure uh, simply didn't exist at the time. So those were two steps toward a future in fabric architecture that failed. And they failed because uh, they got ahead of technology, they got ahead of available materials. Now I'll talk to you about a little bit about <laughs> metamorphosis. Metamorphosis means what does it take, from my point of view, what does it take to convert an abstract idea into a real structure. Now, if you look at the process, first of all, there's a need. Somebody defines what the need is. The Romans wanted a canopy over their, over their stadium. Uh, Bucky Fuller wanted to span a large space. Then there was a curiosity of the innovator, the guy who's looking at this thing, and he's you know, the one who thinks that, well, I can, do, I can do this. I can actually do something. I can come up with an idea. And finally, there were the means, what, they, what means they had available to them. Uh, were the fabric available? Were there, were there ropes available that could make this thing work? And uh, now that leads to the, to the issue of, at the beginning, when, when, the, for instance, when the Romans put, put up their valerium, I'm sure what happened was that they had already had some experience with fabrics. They used fabrics for their sails, they had ropes, uh, in combination with the, with the fabrics. So they knew a little bit about how strong these things were and, and how, they, how they could uh, carry this kind of a roof. But that was a kind of a trial and error procedure. And that led very often to failures. And, and those failures uh, is really what, what led them to, to eventual success. Now that, that really defines for us what is risk. Well, we know that with every new development, there's a certain amount of risk that you have to take. Now, in the past, that risk was easily taken. You know, the architects, engineers, uh, they, they built structures, and sometimes the structures didn't stand up. Sometimes they fell down. Sometimes a portion didn't survive. Now, that, that risk, for instance, when Tom Edison uh, was asked, you know, what about all the failures you had? And he said, uh, I didn't fail. I found a hundred ways that did not work. Well, in our litigious era, that kind of an attitude wouldn't uh, fly very far because we know that uh, uh, you, know, you get sued at every turn for whatever you do, whether it's right or wrong. For instance, when the master builders of the Beauvais Cathedral, and I'm sure many of you have heard about this, Beauvais was a, was a major cathedral in France, and uh, when they built it initially, the central nave was the highest nave ever built, ever tried. Unfortunately, uh, when they first built it, it collapsed because it was just too high, couldn't, couldn't, uh, it wasn't properly supported. So they rebuilt it, only this time they added, they added uh, counterforce, they added uh, uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, flying buttresses on the outside to hold the snave together, so it wouldn't wouldn't uh, uh, fall apart. Now that failure, that initial failure, in all these cases, failure led to new knowledge. It it, it led to future innovation. Now this this brings us to another topic of innovation, and that is that there's always precedent. Something comes before what you're doing now. You know, that it doesn't come out of the ether suddenly out of nothing. So we know that there's, there's, a, there's a process that takes place, and the process usually involves developing an idea that goes much beyond 
everything that's, that's happened before. And it's not a linear development of the original idea, but is a lateral, a way of lateral thinking, jumping over what's been done before and jumping beyond it. There's the story of uh, a scientist at, at 3M. Uh, 3M, there's a scientist at 3M who developed a, he wanted to develop an ad adhesive stronger than anything that had been developed before. So he, he compounded the thing and tried it out on paper and it turned out to be a total failure. It, it, would, it would stick, but you could take it apart. It would stick again, you take it apart. Uh, he thought it was a total failure. 10 years later, after he did that, one of his colleagues picked up the idea and said, gee, you know, I can use this to, to mark my, my missile. When I go to church, I can mark the pages. And that, that little jump in thought, in other words, taking an idea that was previously a failure and coming up with a new way of using it led to a multi-million dollar industry, which we know as post-it notes. <coughs> as it just shows that you know, innovation can suddenly spring into something new. Now, I don't know whether you know this, but, but for instance, uh, Toyota brought out the Prius in about the year 2000. A hundred years earlier, Porsche brought out a car, which was a, which was a hybrid run by an engine, gasoline engine, and drove uh, uh, electric motors in the front wheels. It took a hundred years for that idea to go from the idea to something actually practical. Now, when you think about the, the uh, concept of fabric structures, fabric structures really are kind of economical. You know, they're very lightweight. They're, they're not difficult to build once you figure out the, the tricks involved. And, and uh, but you have to overcome a certain number of problems. The first problem is that you're dealing with, with elements that, like ropes, that are like a, like a wet noodle. Now, when you think about, you know, when, when Tarzan swung across the, the uh, jungle, his weight provided the, the force that rigidized that cable, that, that rope. Now, in the same way, fabrics are also like uh, limp, limp elements. And you have to find a way to rigidize these. So these are two problems that you have to solve before you can really de develop a, uh, a cable structure. One of the first people who looked at that was, and this was back in the 50s, Lionel Vieira, Leonel Vieira in Uruguay. He built this uh, small arena which had a roof that was essentially a dish, a dish-shaped roof, radial cables supporting uh, precast concrete elements that were hooked onto the cables. And that wasn't enough. He had to pre-stress the whole structure. The way he did it was he, he put weights on the precast elements, then concreted in the joints, and then removed the weights. So he had a pre-stressed dish. That, that idea uh, was actually taken over by Fred Severed in uh, some, some years later, quite a few years later, about 10 years later. And he, he designed this roof for Madison Square Garden, same idea. But in both of these cases, of course, the, the, uh, they were not using fabrics, but they were using rigid materials for the actual dish itself. So the idea of, of looking at fabrics, how else can you, can you uh, rigidize the whole, the whole uh, roof structure? One of them is by shaping. You have to find a shape that, that works well and that will actually turn a soft structure into a hard structure. Now, one of the people who did that was, was uh, Fred Severin. For this roof in, um, uh, I think it's in, in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And it was built in the, again in the 50s, in the late 50s. And here it was shaped into a hyperbolic paraboloid. And by shaping it in that way, he was able to rigidize the whole roof. Again, he used rigid materials as the covering material. 
And it took a little longer before we went beyond that. Another idea that was also developed at the same time, and this, uh, this time with different kinds of material covering it, was the, the Olympic Stadium in uh, Munich, 1972, I think. Fry Otto uh, built this uh, really very imaginative kind of structure over the Olympic arena. Uh, and it, again, it's a cable structure, it's shaped. The covering material are, are uh, panels, uh, they're actually plastic panels, acrylic panels. And uh, they've been replaced a couple of times. But it's another, another way of doing it, again, with a different kind of covering material. Uh, Lev Zetlin, one of the, the, actually the founder of Thornton Thomas Hetty, uh, came up with a different way of shaping, and that is by, by using the bicycle wheel as a, as a model. So he has two, la two layers of cables, one above the other, and he spreads them with a hub, a central hub that pushes them apart and actually rigidizes the upper and the lower, the upper cable primarily, and creates a, a, uh, a roof structure that way. Again, these were covered, these were all covered with rigid materials because that was what, what the, uh, that's, that's the way things were in those days. Now, Bucky Fuller, you remember him? Bucky Fuller developed the, the idea of a rigid, lightweight dome, which was a geodesic dome. And he, he uh, went so far as to come up with a number of ideas to use it. And one of the ideas was to, to he happened to be at the right time, right place at the right time. The government was looking for a way to, to provide covers for radomes in the northern portions of Alaska and Canada to protect ourselves against incoming flights from Russia at the time or the Soviet Union. And so these radomes then were built using the geodesic dome covered with a kind of transparent, not, not physically transparent, but, but radiologic, radio, radio transparent material, uh, sometimes plastic panels, sometimes uh, heavy fabrics, and that was the first use of, of real, a real fabric structure. Now, another, another originator here, and this is the first time you really go to almost a pure fabric structure was, was uh, when, when Walter Byrd, and this was back in the 50s again, Walter Byrd came up with the idea, of, and Walter Byrd was really an aeronautical engineer, and he came up with the idea of using uh, fabric as a kind of a balloon structure so he would, he would uh, develop the fabric structure. Uh, and you see him here on the top of, the, of this bubble, which he built. I have no idea how he got up there. You know, it, really, it's a mystery. But anyway, he came up with these. And, they, and these, again, were used as radomes because that was what the market was. But from an architectural point of view, it's kind of a dull, uh, boring structure. But it led to other innovations, and one of the innovations was when, when uh, the, in 1970, Dave Geiger with, with uh, Davis Brody came up with this structure, which was a very low-rise, shallow roof dome for the uh, exhibit in Osaka, Japan. And he, he used a PVC, a, a vinyl type of uh, fabric with glass, and, and uh, that was the first really successful fabric structure, pure, pure fabric structure, you know, cables and fabrics, but it was an, it was an inflatable. I mean, it's, when you think about it, it was an air supported structure. Uh, I actually <laughs> kind of copied the idea and uh, built the same kind of thing in, in Saudi Arabia for an athletic facility a couple of years later. This one's still standing because the, the material I used was uh, PTFE instead of uh, uh, the PVC. So that, that structure is a long lasting structure and hopefully it's still there. Uh, fabric structures and those kind of fabric structures in general are still used for pool covers, for uh, tennis courts and things of that sort. Now, one of the problems with uh, any of these structures is, well, there are a couple of problems. One, they're air supported. So if there happens to be a puncture in the fabric or a tear in the fabric, the thing comes down. You know, it hangs down. So Pontiac Stadium had a problem uh, at one point. Uh, they had a deflation due to 
uh, I think it was a, a uh, power failure. And so the fabric you know, was hanging there and a lot of, lot of the panels actually tore and had to be replaced. Uh, the, the Minneapolis Metrodome, which is a very, very similar structure to this, also had a, a failure due to a deflation. This one was kind of stupid because uh, what happened there was uh, there was a storm, a winter storm, a lot of snow. There was a thaw, the snow melted a little bit. Then in the freeze, so the, the water became ice. And so the, the uh, managers of the arena sent up a crew and said, you got to get that, that ice off. So what did they do? They went up there with pickaxes. <laughs> and of course, with the obvious result, they, they punched a lot of holes in the fabric and, and the damn thing uh, uh, deflated and part of it tore, tore apart. So you've got to be a little careful about these kinds. Now, in the 1950s, back in the 50s, I was, was, was when I was first at uh, Paul Weilinger's office. When I, there were four of us, actually, in the office when we started. Uh, Paul came up with this idea, a different idea of, of uh, using fabrics. This time, he developed a pill, a pill type of structure, air inflated, but this time, you're not inside the, the air, you're outside. The air inflated portion is simply a roof covering and uh, stands all by itself. So even if there's a deflation, it just simply hangs there and it doesn't really bother the people that much. Now, the, the uh, thing about this structure is that there was, well, first of all, we had a very short time to get the whole design and built, less than, than eight months. So we, we were in a big rush. I, I was involved in the design of the roof. I, I got it designed, and then we were asked to come up with a method of, of how, how you're going to get this, this uh, fabric up there. I said, oh, no problem. We'll get uh, winches on all the columns. We'll get a bunch of guys. They'll winch it up. And uh, that's, that's exactly what was proposed. And so I designed some winches. I figured, you know, the fabric weighs, you know, 500 pounds per point. Uh, I'll design a winch for, you know, three, th three you know, four times that much. So uh, fine. So I designed those winches. They come up and they start winching it up. And what I had forgotten was that when you get up toward the top, you know, and, well, this one doesn't work too well, but when you get up toward the top, the, uh, the cable becomes almost horizontal. You know, so the force, instead of being just a small multiple of the weight of the thing, is a large multiple. So what happened is they got up to the top and the force became tremendous. Instead of being, you know, uh, 2,000 pounds, it was eight, 10,000 pounds. And <laughs> the winches failed. And uh, the winches had to be replaced. We had to do it in a big rush. The interesting thing about that, you know, this is 1958. No litigation. No, nobody worried about the fact that we did it and it had to be replaced. The owner accepted that this was an experimental kind of structure. And he... He went ahead and finished it and built it. It was a, a summer theater. Unfortunately, the summer theater in the fall was supposed to be taken down in the fall. They waited a little bit too long. Along came a hurricane and tore the damn thing to pieces. And they never put it up again. <coughs> uh, <clears throat> but we did use the same concept in, in a structure in, in the, uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, <coughs> which I think is still standing today. It's the same, same idea but it was a cover for an ice rink. Now, uh, in, we finally come to, to one of the key structures that, that uh, was built, nothing somebody mentioned that involved here. The uh, <clears throat> two things about this. One, one is, this was again done by Dave Geiger. This is for, for an arena in, uh, uh, well, the original one, the original idea was in, uh, in uh, uh, Korea. It was then repeated in, in the Florida. And the, the idea was to go back to what Bucky had originally thought about. And instead of this rigid uh, steel plate going around the circles, he, he substituted just steel posts. So, and, and use a radial kind of structure because he was dealing with a round kind of a arena. So he did that and in 1986, and he built it for the Seoul Olympics. Uh, and it was a very successful use of that. About uh, four years later, I was asked to, to design the Georgia Dome. The Georgia Dome is different. It's an, it's an oval 
plan configuration. So the radial idea doesn't work as well. Uh, what I did there was I changed the whole concept and, and made it into a diagrid. So you have cables running in two dire directions, a very extremely rigid kind of a structure. And that was, that was uh, built in, in uh, 2000, uh, excuse me, 1994. Well, it was opened in 94, 93 or 94. And now they're talking about tearing it down next year. Anyway, there was a, it was a very successful structure. It still is a very successful building. They make money hand over fist, not with football, but with other events. They have a lot of events going on all the time. Uh, based on that same concept, which I call the 10-star ten, ten dome, 10-star dome. Uh, I don't know why I picked that. 10-star, it it's kind of a star-like configuration. And so it seemed like a nice, uh, nice name. Based on the same concept, we were asked to do a structure in, in Argentina, in La Plata, Argentina. Uh, this was a, a much more complicated configuration. Instead of a simple o oval, the plan looks like a, a MasterCard symbol, like two circles that intersect each other. So the, now, the, the, again, the same idea works. You can use a diagrid arrangement of cables but you have to, be rec you have to re recognize that at the point where you have the, the uh, uh, center, the so-called center of that whole area, you, you do get some compression on some of the cable members. You have to replace them with, with uh, rigid pipes. But it's a, it's a very <coughs> successful structure, and, and this is the way it looks today. Uh, it's actually phase two. Phase one was just the, the steel ring itself, which was a, a truss ring around the whole thing. Phase two brought the fabric up to this point. Phase three, if they ever get the money for it, will actually complete the structure. And uh, two things about this. One is it's a, it's a naturally ventilated structure. Uh, in other words, there, there, there are no walls around the perimeter. And at the top, you've got those two pergolas which actually cover a hole in the roof. So you have natural air circulation through the roof. Now, we also designed, and we'll, we'll see quite a few of these in a few minutes, uh, another structure in Saitama, Japan, using the same concept. Uh, it was a competition and, uh, for a new arena which, which uh, looks this in plan. There was a development on the plan configuration. Uh, again, it had a, a rigid uh, a, 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 a truss ring around the perimeter and a fabric roof in the 10 star configuration. What happened here, and this is a, you know, some of the things that happened in our profession. Uh, this was a competition. We were with a, with a uh, uh, Japanese developer. Uh, the day of the opening of the, of the bids come in, and we find out that, yeah, we, we've, we've won the competition. Uh, 24 hours later, I said, no, no, you lost the competition because your bidder was, was uh, dequalified. He, he apparently was accused of some bribery somewhere in the past having nothing to do with his job. So we ended up not getting the job. Uh, one more disappointment among many. Now, in fabric structures, you also have some problems sometimes. Uh, one of them is in this, is, uh, this is in Montreal, the uh, main arena in Montreal for the Olympics. And it, again, it has a fabric roof. And this building, by the way, had numerous previous problems. The, the, uh, that that uh, uh, neck that goes up, they had problems both with the foundation of the neck, then they, they cast only half of it, and they found that the foundation couldn't carry the rest of it. And then they, they built the rest. And then the idea was that, that you should be able to take the fabric portion and, and pull it up into that hole in the uh, neck. Well, that never worked. Never worked. So the, but the, the most important thing is that at one point there was a storm, a winter storm, snow, lots of wind, and the fabric tore and dumped a bunch of snow and ice onto brand new cars that were being exhibited below. So that, that, that was one problem. Now there are a lot of other roof shapes that one can think of. Uh, and we've developed a number of them. Well, this was for Franklin Park Zoo. Franklin Park Zoo is a, it's a fabric structure with an, a steel arch support, triangular, there are three legs to it. It's still there and it uh, 
was designed for heavy snow loads, actually carries it very well and has carried it very well. No, never had a problem so far. Uh, this is another failed project. Uh, it was a, at the base of a ski jump in Austria. They wanted to have a cover for the, for the uh, people who were watching the stands. And uh, so we designed this. And, and again, it was a you know, successful idea that, that commercially did not work because uh, they never built it. Uh, another one was this pyramidal, pyramidal uh, roof over a uh, uh, athletic facility. Again, a uh, good idea. All fabric and cables, never built. And this is a stadium roof, which was to be built in, in Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, again, this is shaping it to be able to take the, all the forces. Again, a good idea, never built. Now, you could actually design a roof over a uh, baseball stadium. Of course, nobody wants a roof over a baseball stadium, but if you did, you could do it in this manner. Now, you, you could design a roof over a triangular structure, if there were such a thing. Uh, this is just an alternate configuration for, for a typical oval type of uh, plan for, for an arena. Uh, we also did a cover in New York City was ordered by the federal government to do one of two things, either cover their, their main uh, uh, water storage facility or provide a disinfection, uh, hold a, a whole disinfection center. In other words, you had, to, you had to provide a whole pumping facility to disinfect the water. That simply proved to be not a practical way of doing it. The reason they wanted it, because you know, birds, birds will sit on the, on the water, birds will poop in the water. They just felt that that was a, not a clean environment. So they, they asked for that. But what happened was that the, the, the government backed off, didn't need it, and said it wasn't necessary. So the idea, which was an air inflated uh, roof that we actually proposed and, and actually uh, would have been developed in, into an actual uh, construction documents was stopped uh, because they didn't need it anymore. Then if you have an existing stadium and you have to cover it, this is an idea for, for doing a retrofit over an existing stadium and incorporating into the retrofit uh, stands uh, some sky boxes so that you get something more than just the retrofit itself. And so that's a feasible idea. It was developed actually for a particular job. Again, the job did not proceed. <laughs> we got a lot of those. And uh, finally, the, the, uh, in Pusan, in Korea, we were asked to do a, a, they were building a dome. Actually, we designed the dome with them. And uh, this is the, the way the dome looked. It was to be covered, fully covered, but they wanted to have it retractable. So we came up with an idea of providing you know, four leaves that could uh, open like, a, like a, an orange. And uh, the, the way those leaves would open, they would ride in, in carriages that were like uh, uh, similar to, to what you call a, a caterpillar type of arrangement. It had to be flexible because, because the structure below is flexible. So you have to have a, a roof structure that is flexible because it rides on cables. So we developed that completely again Got to the point where, where it was it was completely designed, finished, and then zap, they they stopped the job. So that's that's the way these things occur. Finally, uh, in excuse me, uh, a a um, excuse me, in Ontario, Canada. Uh, TT was asked, uh, Thornton Dunham said he was asked to, to design a, uh, a cover for, for a pavilion uh, f for the Pan Am Games. And he came up with this idea, which are inflatable tubes. And the idea actually is, is, is uh, I'd say, not derivative, but it is a, uh, a really uh, further development of a concept that first was, was actually built for the Fuji Pavilion in 1970 uh, in Osaka, Japan. Now, 
finally, the, the question is, what about materials? I mean, the, we, you know, we've talked about other ways of doing things, but uh, one of the important things is, is uh, what can we do with new materials? Well, we know that uh, we've been using uh, uh, Teflon-coated fabrics a long time, and they're, they're a very good material. We've also looked at ETFE, which are a, a, a transparent film. One of the disadvantages of that film is that ETFE has to be uh, inflated. In other words, it's, it's actually built in pillows. Nobody so far has come up with a better idea to, to change the shape of those so that uh, we didn't have to deal with them as pillows. In the future, there's also a possibility that there is a new material called graphene. Graphene is a uh, material that's actually an, one atom thick and extremely strong, totally transparent. And no one so far has come up with a way of using it. But I'm sure some, some, something will come out uh, in the future and somebody will come up with a good idea. And that really comes to my conclusion, which is uh, as far as innovation is concerned, Innovation can come from anywhere, and I expect that maybe even one of you will come up with a terrific idea, and I hope you do. Thank you.